Hi, and welcome to Coding TensorFlow, a show where we focus on coding machine learning and AI applications. I'm Lawrence Moroni, a developer advocate for TensorFlow. And in this episode, we're going to continue our series about using JavaScript for machine learning in the browser. This is achieved using TensorFlow.js, a JavaScript library for training and deploying ML models in the browser and on Node.js. There's lots of great information about it on the js.tensorflow.org site, including samples, API docs, and frequently asked questions. In the first episode, we took a very basic look at what you need to get up and running with TensorFlow in the browser by building a simple model that fits its values to a line by learning that it is actually a line off of a very small training set. In episode two, we then wanted to focus on data and how you prepare data for training. We did this by taking a popular data set, that for classification of the iris flower, and turned it from raw CSV into a number of tensors, those with feature data and those with label data for both training and test sets. Now that the data is ready, in this episode, we'll take a look at how you can create a neural network to build a model that can be used to classify future data. So when it sees unknown measurements, it will infer from that data which iris flower the data likely represents. It's a simple scenario, but it is the cornerstone building block of all machine learning. From an existing data set, learn how to infer the desired results without explicit programming of rules about those results. So let's get coding. I'm going to start with an asynchronous function called do iris which I will call at the end of my JavaScript block. In the previous episode, we created the iris.js file that contained the data and all the code we wrote to pre-process it. This was orchestrated through a function called getIrisData, which took a parameter that dictated the split between training and test data. By setting it to point 0.2, we're saying that 80% of the data will be for training and 20% for test. So let's call that, and we'll get back our x-train, y-train, x-test, and y-test values. Now we'll create a model by calling a train model function and passing them as parameters to it. We haven't yet created that, so let's do it now. We'll start by making this function asynchronous. We're awaiting its return, after all. Then we'll create our model in the same way as before. It's a sequential network. Next, we'll set up a couple of values for our learning rate and the number of epochs or iterations that we want to run the machine learning for. It's nice to have these as constants so we can tweak them later. The learning rate is used to define the optimizer. And if you remember in episode one, we used stochastic gradient descent. This time, we'll use a different one, and it's called an atom optimizer. There's lots of ways of optimizing machine learning, and Adam was introduced as a methodology in 2015 as an improvement over stochastic gradient descent. It's actually built into TensorFlow, so you just have to turn it on. But if you want the details about it, you can find them on the archive.org site. Now let's create our model. There's an art in how you define your neural network, and you can experiment with different combinations for better or faster results. But in this case, I'm going to use two layers. The first has 10 neurons, and the second has three. The first layer is activated by something called a sigmoid function. I won't go into all the math of that now, but the important thing to note is that a sigmoid function for all inputs will provide an output between 0 and 1, which is perfect for classification, i.e. 0 means it doesn't match, and 1 means it matches. The second, or output layer, will have three units, and I do this because we're classifying to three different types of flower. Its activation is softmax, which is a function that normalizes its input values so that they all add up to one. That way, when we get our classification, it will be a likelihood for each flower, but the three likelihoods will add up to one. We can then compile our model with this optimizer and the desired loss function, as well as the metric that we want to read. The loss function this time is called categorical cross-entropy. And again, without getting all mathy about it, I've found that when you want to categorize something, as we're doing in this case, picking between different types of flower, 
instead of predicting a value like a house price, then using this loss function instead of something like root mean square works much better. OK, now we have our model. It's time to train it. We'll do this with the model.fit method, passing it our training and our validation data. We'll also specify the number of epochs that we want to run the training for. To keep track of its progress, we actually get a callback called on epoch end. In this, we can print our current loss value. And when I run it, you'll see this value diminish epoch by epoch. It's really as simple as that for training. And when we're done, we'll have a model that can classify the input data. So let's now take a look at using the model to do a prediction. We've only trained this model for a little time, only 40 epochs. So we may have some errors, and we'll see how to fix that later. So here I've created a tensor with a bunch of input values that match those of one of the items in the real data. We'll pass this model to get a prediction back, and hopefully we get the same result. So let's run it. You'll see that we get three values determining the likelihood of which flower matches the tensor, and it looks like number two is closest to being the winner. But let's see how we can make that even clearer. Now here's the same prediction, but using the argmax function to polarize the values, effectively setting the likelihood for flower 0 and 1 to nothing, and flower 2 to 1. Think of that as similar to writing a few if-then statements to compare the values to find the biggest. And think about how much easier it is than if you were doing this with 1,000 different values and the number of code that you would have to write. So if you want to test your model against a test set to see how many it gets right, versus how many it gets wrong, you can then do so with this code. For each x in the test set, get the prediction, and then compare it against the real y. If it's the same, you're right. If it's different, you're wrong. If you get a very high error rate, then you can tweak the epochs and the learning rate from earlier and try again. So that's it for this episode of Coding TensorFlow. If you've watched these three episodes and followed along, you'll have taken your first steps into machine learning in the browser with JavaScript. If you prefer to go beyond the browser and use your JavaScript skills with something like Node.js instead, you can still do so. Learn more about that and everything JavaScript related on js.tensorflow.org. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to hit that Subscribe button for more great TensorFlow content.